My name is Frida Afari. I am an <clears throat> Iranian American librarian, translator, and author in Los Angeles, and a member of the <clears throat> Social Responsibilities Roundtable of the American Library Association and the International Respons Responsibilities Task Force. On behalf of the International Responsibilities Task Force, I would like to welcome you to this dialogue with peace activists from Palestine and Israel. Our speakers are Osama Iliwat and Iris Gore. Osama Iliwat is a board member of Combatants for Peace and co-founder of Visit Palestine. He has dedicated his life to opposing the Israeli occupation and apartheid while building meaningful relationships of solidarity between Palestinians and Israelis. He is featured in the documentary Objector and regularly speaks about peace building with organizations across the world. He lives in Jericho, Palestine. Iris Gore, MA in Educational Administration and Leadership with honors and B.Ed. in Mathematics, is an educator and human rights activist, a former school principal in the Israeli education system. She has successfully led organizational and pedagogical processes and changes while emphasizing the strengths and needs of both individuals and society. She has served as the Israeli Community Director at Combatants for Peace from 2021 to 2023. Iris believes that knowing and understanding the other, social responsibility and awareness are the foundations through which we can make our world better. Each speaker will have 10 to 15 minutes to explain the current situation in Gaza, West Bank, Israel, and the urgent need for an immediate ceasefire and possible solutions that can bring about peaceful coexistence of two peoples. Then I will ask a couple of questions from the speakers and will then take questions from our audience. Hello, Frida. Thank you for having us. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for coming to, to listen to what we have to say. My name is Usama Aliwat. As we mentioned before, I live in Jericho. I am 45 years old. Usually, we are doing this activities as part of our peaceful resistance by sharing our personal stories and our narratives because we believe our narratives have a lot to do with, our, with the conflict. And our problem in this land that we are two narratives or two truths that are fighting each other and fighting over who is more victim than the other. And they usually don't accept each other. And this is a place where two narratives can accept each other and live together. So my story starts from 48. My family were, my grandmother were living in a village called Lifta. When I was a kid, she always used to tell me about her village and about the horses and about the olive trees and about everything there. And after she also used, uh, the Jews came and they kicked us out of our lands and they took our houses and they destroyed our houses and everything was the Jews, they have done this. So I grew up with a lot of fears from something called Jews or Jewish people, even though I didn't meet them. <clears throat> when I was 10 years old, my father moved to Jericho because there is law in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem. So my family moved to Jerusalem and then in 67, all of them moved to Jordan or ran to Jordan. Israeli closed the border. No one was allowed to come back except my grandfather. He sneaked back by the borders to Jerusalem. In the beginning of the 80s, my father was working outside Jerusalem and there is law in East Jerusalem for Arabs only because Arabs in East Jerusalem are residents of Israel. Jews are citizens of Israel. 
even if they live in the same neighborhood. <clears throat> so there is law in Jerusalem for Arabs only that if any Arab live outside Jerusalem municipality borders for more than three years, Israel has the right to cancel his residency. So if you move from New York to, to New Jersey three years, you are not allowed to go back to New York anymore. That's only for Arabs. And that's part of the democracy we live in. We moved to Jericho. Uh, it was like the end of the 80s. It was the beginning of the First Intifada. I started in Jericho to see soldiers in the streets and demonstrations and tear gas in my school during the nights, during the days. Soldiers everywhere. So, and all these soldiers used to represent one thing in my head as a child, Judaism. So the only thing I used to know about Judaism are full armed soldiers everywhere, scary. I used to be very scared from them, afraid. And these fears with the time turned to hate. When I was 14 years old, I saw soldiers abusing my father in front of our house, pushing him, taking him in, out the jeep, and asking him to clean and swap the street after the demonstration. And I saw my father was beaten by these soldiers, and the soldiers for me were representing Israel and the Jewish people. I was really mad, and I wanted to do something the age of 14 to resist, to take revenge. And the only thing I could do is to write the graffiti on the wall next to our house. I wrote there with my another friend. We sneak out of the house after midnight and we wrote free Palestine. To be honest, well, by then I did not know where is Palestine and I did not know what is Palestine. And I wasn't actually fighting for Palestine. My fight was against this soldier. That's all I knew. After a few months of feeling really kind of relieved by teasing the soldiers, by writing the graffitis, I decided with my sister to create a Palestinian flag, which wasn't legal by then. It was taboo to have Palestinian flag before the Palestinian Authority. So we started cutting shirts and, and stuff and some clothes and sew it together and hide it from our parents because if they have if they see they will of course not agree with this. And I succeeded to with another friend to hang this flag on one of the trees in the neighborhood, high tree. And after a few weeks we get arrested for that, but there is no charge for raising a flag. But of course, in Israel, because the democracy here work only sometimes in West Bank, it has different rules than inside Israel. So if you don't have any reason to arrest Palestinian, you still have a reason to arrest Palestinian, which is called administrative detention. Administrative detention means that any army commander can take Palestinian from their homes after the middle of the, the middle of the night and take them to jail from one day up to three years without guilt, without court. And this is against the international law, which is flexible on our land sometimes. So that was the thing until until then. I get arrested. Actually, this changed my life. It turned me from a child who doesn't know what he's doing or what he's resisting against to someone who has ideology. I learned everything bad about Israel and about the Jewish people. I learned everything about the massacres in 48, about the Zionist gangs, about what they have done to us, how many Palestinians they killed, how many villages they destroyed, how many families, how many things. And I went out with even more hate to resist and to attack more. But when I went out, it was like I heard talks about agreement by then and that we're going to have our own country and we're going to have our own police 
and we will not need to fight anymore and soldiers will not be front of our, of our schools every day. So I accepted this agreement and I joined the Palestinian police for a few years. After this, I found out that the Israelis keep building settlements and the settlements are growing. And there is nothing to show that we are going to have our fifth of our own historic Palestine, you know. We accepted fifth of Palestine and still we need to negotiate over a lot of things. I quit, I refused to stay in the Palestinian Authority, especially after one of my friends was killed. I wanted to resist again. I kept resisting and joining resistance and arrested and not arrested in and out from the age 14 until 35. In 2010, I met one of my friends who was in Bethlehem, and he told me that he's going to meet something called peace activists. For me, that was weird. What is peace activists? But I was excited to go and practice my English with the peace activists. I went there and I was surprised that the peace activists don't speak English. They speak Hebrew and they were Jews. And I asked my friend, how come, how come they are Jews? You told me peace, act, peace and something. How come Jews and peace work together? He said that there are some Israeli Jews who believe in peace and they want to live in peace. And I said, what do you mean, man, by peace? Since we signed peace, they are confiscating our lands piece by piece. And since we signed peace, they killed their own prime minister who signed the peace agreement because they don't need peace. They don't want peace, really. They are the ones who killed Robin. And he tried to convince me again and again that they want they need peace and want peace. I went out and I was mad and I start to listen to some people speaking in Hebrew. And I heard some Israelis really care about me. They see me as a human being, not as animal, not as something doesn't exist, not as a terrorist only, as a human being. They see my rights. They see the occupation. They see the discrimination. They see the apartheid. They see the ethnic cleansing. I'm not saying this because I want people to see me as a victim, but because this is the reality. I was really touched, and I went back home with a crack in my narrative. How come all these years of knowing only the bad thing about the Jewish people and how evil and violent and whatever they are, now front face, and I was wondering why Israel never tried to show me this face of Judaism, why are they always tried to show me the weapons, the power, the fire, the gel, the jellers, and not really the good heart of the Jewish people. And from there, I started to educate myself more and more. I started to learn more about our other people's narratives. I understood that I am not the only victim in the world. I'm not the first victim of the world. And still understood what happened to the Jewish people all of their life and what happened to them in, in Europe and in many places, not because it's my guilt, but because when you want to, to reach peace with some people, you need to understand their background, you need to walk in their shoes, you need to understand their trauma, their fears and what they had been through in order to build a relation or any kind of relation. So I went uh, to many places in Europe, uh, concentration camps and other places to study and learn more. And I watched many movies about what happened to the Jewish people in the Arab world. And here it doesn't justify what happened to me, but it, to understand a little more about what's going on. And since then, I found out that uh, our main enemy on this land is the separation. We are separated, and we don't know each other. We don't speak the language of each other. And I'm not talking about the one who lives in Israel and the one who is living in Jericho. If you come to Jericho, five minutes away, five minutes away from my house, there is a settlement. Most of these settlers are American Jews. My Hebrew is better than theirs. 
and they still have citizenship, they have all the rights, they have houses, they have freedom of movement, they have army, they have country, they have airport, everything, and they live inside fence with patrols trying all the time around and cameras and security system, and they have been sitting there since 40 years. So I found that this, this separation is the enemy. I created a group called Visit Palestine to bring people to see and to meet each other and to understand each other. And uh, then I heard about Combatants for Peace and I needed to engage with Combatants for Peace with my group. I started to bring people to tours and to explain to them that I'm not fighting against your Judaism and I'm not fighting to throw you in the sea and I'm not fighting because I'm anti-Semite. Yeah, I'm fighting because I deserve rights and I need rights and I should have rights. Yeah, and mostly just to allow people to see each other as a human being, because as Darwish said, Darwish is um, a Palestinian poet, and he's the poet of the revolution. We said the revolution poet. So one of his, his poems with, with his girlfriend, she was Jewish, by the way, her name is Tamar Ben Eri, before he was expelled from Deir al-Assad to Lebanon in the 60s, she wrote him a letter asking when we are going to meet. He said, after a year and the war, she asked, when will the war end? He said, the time we meet. So for me, meeting people and bringing people together to understand the pain and the narrative of each other is the only way to to end this conflict and to end this situation. And I hope I can't do it alone. Iris can't do it alone. We need all our brothers and sisters all around the world, all the human beings' power to, to make it possible. That's my story. Thank you so much. I, uh, as, as you told uh, everyone, I'm an educator. I was a school principal. And I was born in a conservative a little town in Netanya, it's north to Tel Aviv, uh, in a Zionist family. My mother was a Holocaust survivor, and also my father and my mother came as refugees from Europe after the war. So the narrative I grew up was, we are the Jews, we are, we have like the only country is Israel, it's a small country, we are surrounded by enemies, Everyone hates us. They want to throw us to the sea, etc. I'm sure you know all this, all this uh, narrative and stories. And all that I was taught in school uh, by my parents, by society, is nothing else but that uh, the Jews have one state, the Arabs has a lot of states. I didn't know even the word Palestinian wasn't something that I knew about. And as much as it will be very peculiar, I didn't know the word occupation. Like occupation was nothing that was in my vocabulary. And when I grew up, I understood that something is wrong there. Like there are some people over there like. 14 kilometers east from my hometown, but something is wrong, but I don't really understand and now, and I don't think I know more than than that about the Arabs in, in Israel is, and uh, like there is something else. And then in 2017, my youngest daughter came to me and she said, mom, I'm not going to serve the army. And my first reaction was yelling at her. And just to say, in Israel, serving the law, the army is, is a law. Uh, girls for two years and boys for three years. So my first reaction was like, what? How dare you? How dare you not going to the army? It's the law. Everyone is doing it 
Like your brothers went to the army, they were combatants. Your grandfather, my, my father was an officer in the army. And I, I was really shocked. And there was, and she was shocked also because I never yelled at her before. And then there was a quiet in the kitchen. And I thought to myself, um, all my life, I teach my students and my children to be, to ask questions, to have critical opinion, to have their own opinion. And now when my daughter is coming to me and I'm not respecting her, so I came back to her and I said, okay, I respect your decision. And to make this a long story short, it's after, uh, it ends with four months in a military prison. She was in the military prison for four months, 104 days exactly. And when she went to the jail, she said, mom, will you be my voice outside? And I said, of course. And all of this process made me ask questions for the first, I think for the first time in my life. I started to ask questions. Why is she doing it? What is going on there? What is the reality? What I'm missing here is something. And I went to tours. I went to see. I went for the first time to see what is the, what is it, occupation? And what is the, the West Bank? And what is the reality there? I went to tours with Ramin, with uh, Breaking the Silent, and with Combatants for Peace. I started with the movement Women Wage Peace, and then joined Combatants for Peace. But the most important thing to understand that I really didn't understand what is really going on. And once I saw what is the reality of people under occupation, it's like you see the evil and you see this, this horrible things. And then I couldn't go back to my, my life before. And I decided that this is, I need, this is what I need to do. I need to share what I discovered. I need to share it with more Israelis. And something more happened during this journey. I met for the first time in my life, at the age of 52, I'm 59, at the age of 52, I met my, the first Palestinian woman. So you can live your whole life as Israelis without meeting any Palestinian. We, we, we build fences, not only physical fences, but also in our heart with our knowledge. And this uh, woman from Hebron, she's my best friend now. I couldn't believe when I was younger, I couldn't believe that I, I will Arabic um, friend, the Palestinian friend, it was now, how could, no, not at all. And now like I'm not talking about Arabic, but I'm trying to learn about two narratives. The story is about two people, like Osama said, you can see the houses. You can see I'm Natania, my hometown is 14 kilometers. Uh, uh, um, it's so close and you don't know each other. And I think this is the main thing that we are trying to do, to let more and more people understand that if we will know each other, will be the key to stop the hate, stop the fear, um, stop the revenge. Yeah, we, there are some opportunities for solutions. And one of them is like um, building a federation or um, separate with um, different regions. And uh, the one that I'm talking about is called... Um, or oh, two states, one land, one homeland. Yeah, two states, one homeland. And I think, in my opinion, this is the best that we can have now. But before we will talk about possibility of political agreement in the whole area, we need to stop the war, the war in Gaza, and then go to um, talking about solution, political solution. As someone who's living in the land, I want to tell you the problem is not to find solutions. There are too many solutions. I can give you a list of solutions that can end this situation. 
the problem here who gonna commit to the solution who gonna commit to the to the uh, let's say conditions of the solution united states will support or will put veto when someone violate the international law and don't listen to the solution or will make punishment like on iraq and iran that's the thing the thing is, some people violate the international law 140 times and they still save. Some countries violate the international law every single day. The problem is the Americans use veto to protect Israel from international decisions more than to protect the United States itself. They used veto 90 times, 70 times for Israel against you to protect Israel from the international law. I'm not saying Israel is the bad uh, goat now or the, the black goat and we are the good one. I'm saying there is international law and the international law doesn't work and we won't reach any solution as long as there is racism and the international community, especially the big colonizers, are standing for one side. That's the problem. It's not the solutions. The two-state solution was working. But Israel was building settlements every day until today. And this is against the international law. And you, the Americans, you hosted Smutrich, who is settler, illegal settler against the international law, living in West Bank. And he became minister and you hosted him, even though he's illegal. I mean, in America, that the, war, the law doesn't work on everyone the same way. That's our problem, and that's why we are not reaching solutions. Not because we don't know how to reach solutions and we don't find solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. And so that takes me to my uh, question. And I ask this question as someone who's from the Middle East and writes about human rights struggles, especially in Iran. For over a century, the Middle East has been a site of global power rivalry, first among Britain, Russia, France, and then between the US and Russia, and more recently China. During the past four decades, we've seen increasing regional power rivalry among Israel, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey. The region has been the site of recent mass movements against authoritarianism, such as the 2011 Middle Eastern and North African Spring, most notably the popular uprising in Syria, which was brutally crushed, and the 2022 Women Life Freedom Movement in Iran, which opposed misogyny, religious fundamentalism, authoritarianism, ethnic discrimination, exploitation of labor, and that was has also been brutally crushed for the most, or re repressed for the most part. Given this situation, how do you think Palestinians and Israelis can contribute to people-to-people -people solidarity in the region to promote human rights and articulate emancipatory alternatives? It's a little bit, I think it's big <laughs> to put it all on the Israelis and Palestinians, but there is something that I, I noticed, and I think, in my opinion, the world is, is looking at the situation in the Middle East, especially at the Palestinian and the Israelis, like, like a laboratory, you know? Like, we'll see how, they're, how they will get on with each other, and then we can learn from it, from good or for the bad. This is something that I, I think, in my opinion, this is what is going on. It's like a, the, the Middle East is like a playground for the whole world. Um, and this playground, which we are the toys in this playground, uh, the toys for the for the United States, for the the the, the European, even for China or Russia, and maybe, and I'm trying to be optimist, but maybe if we will try to solve our problem in our region and to bring people to understand that you can live with freedom, equal rights, dignity, and to care and to see the humanity in each other, maybe this is something that we can um, be as an example. And another thing that I want to say 
is that the problem that we have in the Middle East, it's not only our problem. This is part of the international community. This is part of the of what is going on all over. It's not only here. People must learn to see other as humanity, to see the humanity in everyone. And maybe if we will try with the help of the international community, solve it here, maybe it will be a start and we'll go all over. But this is my opinion and I'm sure Thank Osama you. has something to say. Thank you. Yes, Osama. Yeah, I think here the situation here is more than Israeli-Palestinian. It's a lot of interests. Not only the Western world, also Iran and Saudi Arabia and all these people. The thing, the main problem here is not all these countries. The main problem here is the justice doesn't exist here and the international law doesn't work here, no matter who's the players there. No matter who's the players. And there are some people who can do whatever they want in this world and they are always safe of punishment, like the Russians or the Americans or the Germans or whatever, many other people. Like in Iraq, for example, I want to go further. One million people get killed in the war in Iraq and, and hundreds of American soldiers. And in the end, they didn't find any anything, any reason to kill these people. We didn't see the world putting George W. Bush in jail or in court for destroying and killing. So that's why the leaders of the world are keep doing the same things again, because unfortunately, who feels safe from the punishment will keep miss, miss how they say it, will keep misacting, or I don't know the, the exact word in English, just uh, they, will, they will not act like according to any law. And this world is ruled by laws. The minute we, we give up all the, ro the laws we commit to, it will be just a forest. And that's what's going on here. I don't have water in my town, even though it's the oldest city of the world, it's 12,000 years old. It's before Judaism and before Islam and before Christianity. People lived here. It's the town where Jesus was baptized and where Jesus was tempted. It's the town that has a lot of history from the Canaanites. And now I don't have water because the settlers around me, the illegal settlers, according to everything, are taking the water. How many times I can I should explain this to the people? And when I feel my children are dying because they don't have water and I scream, suddenly all of you stand up and say, come on, anti-Semite, anti-Jews, anti-Israel, anti-anti. No, I am anti-discrimination. And that's, I came back to the same subject. That's what I think is the main problem. The main problem is the double standards of the international community and the big countries who call themselves democracy and they are calling for human rights and animal rights and women rights and kid rights and all the rights. In the end, when it's about Arabs or Palestinians, unfortunately, all these rules melt. The people who genocide other people and say never again, the same people who are sending muscles now to kill and genocide children in Gaza, they did not change the, the, main, the mindset. They just changed the title from anti-Semitism to Islamophobia. And that's the problem. We are falling in the same holes again and again. That's the problem. The, 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 the racism of the world. They don't see us deserve. They don't see us as a human being who deserve to live normal. I don't hate Iris. If I did not meet Iris and we didn't see her heart, and I didn't see, and she did not protect me in the demonstrations, and I protect her here. We won't be friends. So I didn't, I didn't hate her in my life. I hated her system, and as, and this system is what keeping us enemies. And this system, they are keep facing this system from America, from everywhere, and here inside also. 
here we are feasting uh, Hamas. Who who gave Hamas 15 million, 15 million dollar three years ago from from uh, Qatar? Bibi Netanyahu. He gave them this in 2000. Israelis destroyed all the Palestinian Authority power in Gaza in order to give Hamas the opportunity to take over, because that was the main reason for the existence of Hamas, to divide the Palestinians to two groups. Thank you. No, absolutely. It's very, very complicated. We have all these both external and internal barriers in our, in our struggle right? and double standards everywhere. And so uh, I have one more question, and then we ask the audience for their questions. So as some of you might know, the Social Responsibilities Roundtable of the American Library Association produced a statement last November, which simultaneously opposed Hamas's brutal October 7 assault on Israeli civilians and Israel's brutal invasion of Gaza. The statement concluded and I'm going to read a, a, a few sentences from the statement. It's concluded, be it resolved that the Social Responsibilities Roundtable, in accordance with our commitment to peace and humanity, condemns violence and advocates for the uh, US President and Congress to, one, call for an immediate ceasefire and the release of all hostages held by Hamas, two, suspend military aid to the government of Israel until the occupation is ended and the long-term security, well-being, and dignity of both Israelis and Palestinians are achieved. Three, demand the end of Israeli policies depriving Palestinians of food, water, electricity, fuel, medical care, and shelter. And four, condemn the violence between Palestine and Israel and commit to working toward a peaceful solution that recognizes equally the rights of both peoples to strive in the land of Israel, Palestine. Unfortunately, that statement was not approved by a majority of the leadership of the American Library Association. And we in the Social Responsibilities Roundtable continue to push for these demands, while we also urge our US colleagues and library patrons to vote in the November 2024 elections and prevent the loss of the civil liberties and human rights that we still have in this country. I would like to know what you think US librarians can and should do to help promote international people-to-people -people solidarity with Palestinians and Israelis who believe in peaceful coexistence and respect for human rights. I must say that I cannot understand people that are not willing to sign this letter. You must know, I'm sure you know, not Israel, not the Palestinian people, even not Hamas. We are not economic independent. Like without the money and without the weapons from the USA, from Europe, from whatever, we will not survive. None of us. So the responsibility for what is going on in our region is mostly with the, from the USA. If you will not, it's, it's your tax. You're paying taxes that are with this money, the war is going on. And Israel continue to do what she's doing in the West Bank, in Gaza, everywhere and in this in these days, the last days, I must say that in my opinion, and I can say it as a, as a second generation for the Holocaust, in my opinion, what is going on now in Gaza, it's a genocide. It's another Holocaust. And the responsibility for what is going on there, these thousands of women and children, and I, be sure that also the 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 the, uh, the girls that are raped and kidnapped now in Gaza in my house also every day every night. But at the same time, in my house now is the thousands of children 
that were killed, that they are often, they are dying, they are starving. And who is responsible for that? The responsible, he, the one, the, the state, the, 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 the international community, and sorry to say, but mostly the United States, the money and the weapons are coming from your tax. So this is your responsibility, not only us. This is your, as international, as American, you have the responsibility to ask that those things, these terrible things will not be done with your money. I'm calling everyone, the international community, whatever I am. I'm, I'm, I'm going around speaking, whatever. Who can, who is willing to, to hear me? I will speak with him. Please. Call your government to stop, stop sending money, stop sending military equipment to Israel, surely for Hamas also. Choose to be pro-humanity, choose to be pro-peace. This is the way you can help us. And we need your help. For me, I don't expect from American governments to do anything for Palestine, to be honest. I give up on the American governments because America is the only country that canceled my visa after the new peace activist. So I, I, all what I, I am not, I am not now asking the Americans or anyone to stand for Palestine, really, because standing for Palestine or on the Palestinian side is also one-sided, and I'm not asking anyone to stand for one side because that will keep us in this circle, but. Is there a way to stand for justice? Is it something acceptable in America to stand for justice? Is there justice in this world? That's all what I am saying. All these senators and people who are saying no ceasefire, who you are to say no ceasefire, who you are to give permit to death of children and men and women are sleeping in their beds, who are you? Who are you to give permission to some people to take the life of other people and you give them cover? Who are you? Who are you to teach us morals in this world? And about Hamas and what they have done in the 7th of October as a Palestinian, as Muslim, as fighter, as someone who resists most of his life, I will say this is shame on Islam, and this is shame on the Palestinians, and this is shame on my religion and my people to go and kidnap children, five and six years old children from their homes. This is against all my beliefs as Arab, as Muslim, as a human being, yeah? But it doesn't justify it doesn't justify the big countries allowing genocide. Of course, don't call it genocide. I don't want to fight over if it's genocide or not. But I want to tell you that no genocide in this world was committed in advance. When we will know that it's genocide or not? What is your numbers, guys? What is your numbers? When we can call it genocide? 80% of Gazan people don't have ceiling. 80% of the kids don't have fathers and mothers. What you expect? You are not supporting Israel. You are endangering the future of the Jewish people in the Middle East for another 100 years. There are three to four generations, as at least from 1950 until today, there are three to four generations. They both were born and raised on this land. So it is their homeland, no matter what. Why they don't have the same rights? Why don't they don't have the same quality of life? Why they don't have the same passports? They don't have the same freedom of movement? That's the question. And by the way, I have taken all the American diplomats and all the European diplomats, and I showed them every single thing. There are two kinds of settlements, by the way. 
One is called settlement, which is illegal according to the international law. And it's legal according to the Israeli law, because the Israeli law is different than the international law a little bit. But, but the outposts, they are illegal according to the Israeli law, and illegal according to the international law. And they still have all the services, they still have public transportation, they still have soldiers to protect them, and they are safe of any punishment. 300 settlers went down to Hawara. They burned the whole village. It's pogrom. Happened a few months before 7th of October. We did not see the word panicking the same way. 300 settlers went down. They burned the whole village. They killed two people. No one was detained, not arrested. Same in Tormos Aya. Tormos Aya is another village where most of Tormos Aya citizens are American Palestinians. Yeah, where most of them are American Palestinians and they hold American passports and they were burned in their houses. Then the American ambassador showed up, thank God. And they make deal with, with the Israel. You know what? They didn't apologize. They didn't arrest them. They didn't do anything. The only deal they said, okay, now the Palestinian Americans can come to Ben Gurion and they can move free in Israel, and soon the Israelis will come free to America without visa. That's what happened after the pogrom in Tormos, another village called Safa. Every single day, Buma, every single day we have settlers attack. Twelve years old boy, the beginning of Ramadan, he was playing with. Firework, this big, firework, this big. Yeah? They shot him. He, they killed him in front of the camera. And uh, the minister of the security, the terrorist who was, who was accused of five terror issues, according to the Israeli law, he came and he thanked them and he said that's what they should do. That's my, our problem. Our problem is the law works sometimes and doesn't work other time, and it's black and white. Okay. Again, thank you, Osama and Iris, for these extremely enlightening presentations and and discussion. We have two questions in the Q and A. I'll read them one at a time. The first is from Karen, and Karen asks, "What do you think about uniting uniting Palestinians, Israelis, Americans?" to fight capitalist rulers in the U.S., Palestine, and Israel? How can we grow such unity, working-class unity? I want to say the only thing that I have to say for this is that inside Israel, the people that are against occupation, most of them are also against capitalism and are from the social parties. But I can understand the question, but I must say that we are in such a horrible time now that for me to speak about capitalism and socialism, etc., it's like a little bit far away. I know it's 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 everything is connected, and we are talking about international problems, etc. And of course, money. <laughs> I always uh, say to my children, when you don't understand something, look for the money. Yeah. And the the there is the reason. The reason for everything is look for the money. But it's really tough for me to think about like what will be in the future. We are we are struggling for life now. We are struggling for life and death. This is it. It's life and death. And and, and there is something more that I wanted to say. Sorry for like coming in now. You think about Israel as a democracy, and I really want to you to understand Israel is not a democracy anymore. Not a democracy as you think it is. You cannot say what you want in Israel. You have no, uh, you, you cannot, and you can demonstrate, but you, it, it's getting more and more difficult. And even there are a lot of people that are afraid to speak aloud. I can tell you about teachers that are afraid to speak. And especially if you are Arab Israeli, you will go to jail if you speak not the way the authority will agree. So 
speaking about more than that, it's too difficult for me. And the solution is not even to divide the land because there is no way to divide it over here. The solution is to share the land. And to share the land, we need all the capitalists in the world to forget their interests in our in our blood and in our land. Yani Americans are supporting uh, Israel with billions of dollars of weapons. And when I was in America, I have seen homelessness in the streets more than all my life in one street. So America has a lot of problems to deal with before they are going to spread their killing machines all around the world. Colonialism could be in many ways, like the, colo the Russian colonialism in Syria now, for example. Yeah, this is another kind of colonialism, and it's the new way of colonialism. It's you don't go there, you don't occupy the land, but you occupy the system. Like you think Saudi Arabia is free, or any of the Arab countries are free, they all colonize somehow by some other powers in the world, uh, other countries. That's what I want to say. And about democracy, the two systems, there is two million Arabs, Palestinians, living inside Israel. Israel don't want to call them Isra Palestinian Israelis. They call them Israeli Arabs because they want to erase the identity of Palestine. So they don't even call them Palestinians. They call them Israeli Arabs. So these people, they have citizenship. They have full rights by the law according to the law, like the black Americans, the African Americans, for example, or not the African, the Americans, Americans, but the black Americans. They have all the rights in the in the papers, but when it's when it's in different places, when it's in the court, there is different. And that's what's going on right now over there. And there is a new law was was found in two in two years. It's called the nation law. So actually, the Western world are telling us religions are dangerous. When religions mix with politics, this is the most dangerous thing. The Crusaders saw all the European countries they separated between religions and politics. At the same time, they are telling us, yeah, but God promised them the land, but God chose them, but God whatever. So I don't know how you sometimes you mix religions with with politics, and sometimes you want to separate religions from from the politics. So that's the, the double standards of this thing. The other, the other side of Israel is West Bank, where I live. So I live here under full Israeli control. What do you mean, Palestinian Authority? People think that I have country. The Palestinian Authority doesn't have authority. The Palestinian Authority are doing a civil work like municipality. Is instead of taking care any occupying power in the world, according to the international law, they should give services and serve the people who are living under their occupation. And Israel used to do this until they bring babysitter. They brought babysitter to us called the Palestinian Authority. And the Palestinian Authority, the president of the Palestinian Authority, can't leave Ramallah without permission from the officer in Beit, who's the Israeli officer who's sitting over there. So we in West Bank, we live without citizenship. We are five million people. We don't have the right to vote for the country who's controlling us. We live without citizenship. We live without rights. And we live under absolute apartheid system. When I live, Osama, Adib, Muhammad, Aluat, who I know my seven, seventh grand, uh, grandfather or great-grandfather, they were all live in Jerusalem and born in Jerusalem. When I have no rights, and the one who just came from America last year have all the rights, and the one who's living with me right here, very close to me here, have all the rights, this is apartheid. And I want to come closer. In Hebron, if you have been in the old city of Hebron, I invited you to visit the old city of Hebron. You will see, the, the if you go to Shuhada Street, you will see the building is two floors. One floor is Palestinians who are living there since ages. And the second floor, they were Palestinians, but they were kicked out. And a settler family lived next to them, on, on the state of them. And my question to the Americans, what do you expect from my child? He's sitting here. He's in the university. Every time he goes to university, 
18 years old soldier, take him out of the car, handcuff him, blindfold him, uh, slap him a few times, uh, three hours, four hours, until the shift change, and then the other shift beat him and released him. How should this kid live in this world? What do you expect from him? We deserve to live free. We were born free. We deserve to continue our life free. And resistance is a legitimate right for any people living under occupation. Uh, next one uh, I would like to uh, like to put out there is from Don, and it says in the U.S. in the 1920s. There was a takeover of the content of children's books in the United States and the U.S. to brainwash the superiority of one group and to attempt to convince the children of former slaves that they were happier or that they had been happier as slaves and, and, and would be as continuing as oppressed. Um, are Palestinians and Israelis experiencing this type of brainwashing in the school systems? I can tell you about the the Israeli system, the education system. I still assume to be uh, that I was part of it. Yes, we are doing brainwash from childhood, and I was part of it as a child. I was part of it, and when I grow up, uh, I'm ashamed to say that I was part of it as a cheater, as a teacher. Uh, we have only one narrative, as I said at the beginning, the Zionist narrative. You can see it in poems, you can see it in, in songs, you can see it in stories, you can see it in the in the educational system, in the curriculum, what we have. And I want to add something now that is very sad for me. When I was a child, at least, even if we talked about one narrative, at least we talked about peace and we thought about peace or we said that we dream to have peace. But when I grew up and uh, later, and I think when I'm trying to think, I think it was after the second Antifada, the, in the Israeli education system, the teachers stopped talking about peace. It was like the word itself was not uh, allowed uh, speaking about. It was something that no one is talking about. The The system was like the, the, the teachers taught about only about the Jewish history, the relationship between God, earth, and as Osama said, the promised land, the chosen people, and less and less about humanity, about peace, about the things that we always grow up with. So yes. I can, I, sadly, I will say that in the Israeli side, surely it, there, will, there is a, a brainwash. Yeah. Yeah. I will say, I will say the same actually in the Palestinian system. We learned only, we learn only, first of all, I want to say that when I was a child, Palestinian Authority wasn't exist. So there were no Palestinian system. My books used to come from the Israeli education ministry. So my books used to be Judah and Shimron in the top, and it coming from them. So I did not have really education about Palestine or about what is the story of Palestine. But our teachers always, who are the teachers? The teachers are people from the public, normal people. They always have one side story, our story only. And that's the problem also. We don't recognize the right of the Israelis to be on this land. We don't recognize anything uh, of the other side. Even when we draw the map, both sides, when we draw the map, I have been in Israeli schools and Palestinian schools. Israelis draw the whole map and write on it Israel, and Palestinians draw the whole map, write on it Palestine, and no one, and that's what I say, peace is a place where two narratives can meet and accept each other. Next question um, is, someone is asking uh, for more, they want to know more about the relation between Hamas and Netanyahu. So we, we don't really know what is, I, I don't really know what is the relationship between them. And they could not have real relationship, but somehow the two systems are serving each other. So there is law in this world. We, you, we, need, we need the enemy 
as Palestinians. We need the enemy to be united, as Israelis to be united, and we need the enemy to be separated as Israelis and Palestinians. So I think there is some interest between Hamas and Netanyahu, and they both need each other to keep to stay in power and to keep people under their control. How can we support combatants for peace more directly? I guess they mean how can we as librarians or, or as, as people in the United States and North America? Thank you. So I have I have I have two things to say. First thing is I want everyone to know that the problem did not start yesterday or did not start when Netanyahu became prime minister. Yeah? The problem is 75 years or 55 years old. So it's not about Netanyahu only. There is a system, and this system is working the same way, no matter who's in power. The other, reason, the other question is how you can support combatants for peace. Because if you are a teacher, you can support combatants for peace by teaching about this conflict. If you are a taxi driver, you can just educate yourself and educate other people. If you are a millionaire, you can write check and send it to us, donate it to us, so we can do things on the ground. If you are a journalist, you can talk and bring people and host us. If you are a connected person, you can create or uh, more and more Zooms like this and give us stage to talk to people, minds and hearts. So there are too many ways. Everyone knows his own way. The biggest way to support the, the case here is to make pressure on your governments to support justice for everyone on this land and not one side. That's the biggest way. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to add that we have American Friends of Combatants for Peace organization in the United States that are working with us, the Palestinian and the Israelis. And you can join them and get the newsletter from them and you know from them about everything that's going on in, in, the, in the region. And another thing, on the 12th of May, we have the common memorial ceremony, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, memorial ceremony. It is going on for almost, this will be, I think, the 19, yeah, 19 years now. And on the 15th of May, we have the common Nakba ceremony. And I think these two ceremonies are very important. Uh, and they will be broadcast uh, one at the 12th May and one of the 15th. And if you can share it in your uh, page or you can have um, uh, some in your house to uh, um, call people and, and uh, watch together in the ceremonies, I think it's very important. And as Osama said, I think the most important thing, just tell more and more people that we are looking for your help. We are calling the international community, help us, like SOS. We need your help. Stop the war. Help us stop the war. Thank you, Elise. I will say, I will say more, Elise, because this war is not the everything we need to stop. We need your help to stop the incubation and the discrimination. Because if we just stop the war and then we keep everything happening the same way, we will have more and more wars in the coming few years. So what we need, we need to end the main reason, the base of the conflict and not the details, this war or that war. We need justice, we need international pressure, we need the Americans and everyone in the world to stand the same way for the rights of the Palestinians, same way they stand for the rights of the Ukrainians, same way they stand for the rights of everyone in this world. Israelis won't be safe as long as Palestinians are not free. And Palestinians won't be free and, and or safe as long as Israelis are not safe. So in order to create peace, we need to protect the Israelis, to make Israelis feel safe and to give Palestinians their own freedom.
but we have a life solution here. If you go to Nazareth, to Haifa, for example, you don't see people running away with knives or running around with knives. You don't see Palestinians carrying weapons to kill Israelis, and you don't see Israelis carrying weapons to kill Palestinians. Why? Because they give people rights, because the people have what to lose. And in order to stop this conflict, we need to give people what to lose and not to kill people. Because I myself want to end Hamas. And what Israel and America is doing right now, they are creating more and more Hamas for the next 50 years, and they are not stopping Hamas. In the end of this talk, I want to say something I usually say. I want to say, if you are here, if you have come here to stand for us, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because our liberation is bound up with yours as a human being, we have a lot of things to do. Thank you so much.